we have an inherent wisdom within our body to seek out healing and healing relationships and to kind of be called to what we need to do. So if you're listening and and healing or something really resonated with you, like your body has a wisdom and start listening to that wisdom. And you might start get called to certain people or certain books or certain places and start to listen to that because that is your body's wisdom of saying, I'm, I'm feeling like I need to go in this direction. And the inherent wisdom of warm, safe, non-judgmental relationships, the more you your body experiences them, the more the wisdom of your body will seek them. And so that's how you heal your nervous system. Hey friends, welcome to The Good Life with Michelle Lamoureux, a show for women in midlife who want to live happier, healthier, and more meaningful lives. I'm your host, Michelle Lamoureux, a self-love coach and the author of Design a Life You Love. And together we're going to be doing just that. Each week I bring on world-class experts, best-selling authors, leading entrepreneurs, and also do solo casts with the intention of inviting you to get connected to what you really desire from your life. This show is produced with love every week. There's inspiration and actionable tips in every episode because I want to see women playing a starring role in their lives instead of living on the sidelines. Be sure to join the Good Life Community newsletter over at thegoodlifecoach.com for more inspiration and tips to live your best midlife. And make sure you're following the show on your favorite podcast player. I'm so glad that you're here. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be discussing what it means if you are anxiously attached in your relationships. And joining us today is Jessica Baum, who's a licensed mental health counselor and the founder of the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach, which provides couples therapy, family counseling, and addiction therapy in Florida for over 10 years. She's also helped thousands of clients with her unique approach to healing called the self full method. Through her sister company, Be Self Full, Jessica offers transformational courses and online coaching services that support individuals and couples to form healthy, long-term relationships. She's the author of Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and Love. Welcome, Jessica. I'm so happy you're here today. What an amazing book you've written. I know it's been out in the world, but... um, the, the soft cover is out now too, right? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to do this podcast. Um, well, I think a great place to start is just to have some foundational understanding of the terms that are used throughout the book. And um, so we are all like understanding. I actually would also like to ask you what kind of therapy is imago therapy? Is that what you practice essentially? I practice a lot of different modalities, but Imago therapy is specifically couples counseling. And, you know, they believe that we attract um, people into our lives with positive and negative um, traits of our primary caregiver and that you can do a lot of deep work in your romantic partnerships because that brings up, you know, your attachment issues and a lot of other things that are usually um, connected to the root of what's going on for you and where your healing is. Got it. And I think that goes along with what a lot of what you wrote about in the book. So can you define for us what it means to be anxiously attached? Sure. You know, attachment, um, your attachment style has, is something that kind of lays, gets laid down in, in the early years of your life and anxiously attached. Um, scientific word is ambivalent attachment is someone who struggles with consistency. They usually have the hallmarks of codependency. So as a baby, they become hyper aware of their primary caregivers. And so they can self-abandon and attune to the environment pretty well as an adaptive strategy. So often these babies, the hallmark would be inconsistency. So if I'm going to be in a relationship, my experience is I don't know if it's going to be consistent or will this person show up? Sometimes there's often consciously abandonment issues. Sometimes there's intimacy issues. And the behaviors can be like trying to control your world or people pleasing and all the codependent traits might show up for someone who is more anxiously attached. Okay. And then there's the other style, which is avoidant, anxiously avoidant. Is that correct? 
Um, there's three other styles. There's okay. secure, there's avoidant, and then there's fearful avoidant. So um, secure is makes up a bulk of the population. They have an easier time with closeness and intimacy and boundaries and also don't have um, big abandonment issues. And then there's avoidant who tend to not want to get as close and tend to be a little bit more independent. And then fearful um, struggles with both getting close and being alone. So they can feel a little trapped and you know, attachment is a two-way street. So it's not just your patterns, it's your patterns in combination with somebody else's embedded patterns that create the relational bedding patterns. So you can be more anxious with your partner and not as anxious or maybe even avoidant with your boss, right? So it's it's not as straightforward, but knowing kind of the way in which you respond to pain and where you land can really give you some insight as to how you adapt it and, and possibly work on healing some of that. Yeah, it's so interesting because I was curious. I mean, in the book, you talk about within, you know, the partnership, but I was wondering how it also played out in other relationships with friends and everything. But for the purposes of today's conversation, we'll keep it focused on um, the relationships. If you're securely attached, do you tend to attract others who are securely attached or there's no sort of formula for that? Because I think like a lot of the examples in the book are people who are anxiously attached w- with somebody who's a, who has the avoidance style. And I'm just wondering, do we get yeah. attracted to somebody who quote unquote completes us, which is obviously not what we're really looking for, but maybe energetically yeah. we we seek out without meaning to? Yeah. So anxious and avoidant can um, attract each other because the anxious person is looking for someone who seems stoic and independent. Yes. And that tends to be like the traits that they idealize and and they don't feel they have on their own. Yes. Um, except avoidant people aren't really that stoic and independent. They're actually anxious inside. And an avoidant person might love the liveliness and the life and the, you know, emotionality of a anxious person and struggle with that um accessing their emotions. So it's kind of attracted to the lost parts of themselves. Um, Mm. I talk a lot in the book about how to work with the anxious attachment coupling because it happens a lot. Yes, And if you're a little bit anxious, you might show up a little bit anxious, even with a secure person. So it's not really like your patterns are your patterns and they're going to play out with another person's pattern. The difference between someone who's anxious and avoidant where you kind of get into trouble is that an anxious person in order to feel safe runs towards Mm. connection and wants to get closer. And an avoidant person in order to feel safe when they're scared runs away. So what happens in that dynamic is one person shuts down and the other person's trying to get back into connection. And often the very thing that they need to regulate their nervous system and calm down is the opposite thing that the other person needs. So they get stuck in these cycles. I'm just thinking about how I was able to navigate a situation or my level of awareness at 18, going into a very abusive relationship emotionally with a narcissist. I didn't know what gaslighting was. Like I didn't have any context or awareness and yeah. how at the end of two years of, you know, when that relationship ended, how I literally had come undone, you know, and had to learn how to rebuild myself and love myself and literally kind of become a person like who I was. So that became the invitation. And I know you talk about that in the book. I just think like, I never made that mistake again. I found emotionally unavailable people after that until I was ready to be like, more committed. Like it was definitely a process, but yeah, yeah, I didn't know if that had something to do with the way that I was able to actually orient to the world. And I don't mean to use, you know, I'm not obviously a therapist, so these are sort of the language I'm using. So feel free to like translate it into the sure, more technical. Yeah, and I, I've been there. I've been there with a narcissistic relationship, but here's the thing. If you weren't bathed in certain neurochemicals when you were young, so if your mother or primary caregiver didn't attune to you and bathe you in oxytocin and serotonin and these chemicals that your brain really needs, when you get older and a man comes along and they make you the center of the world, which is often referred to as love bombing, if you didn't get that as a baby, that's going to become so much more intoxifying or alluring to your brain as an adult. So you're going to be pulled towards that type of attention because it's something that you didn't actually receive. So you're actually more vulnerable depending on the way in which you were raised. If there was neglect, you're even more vulnerable to those types of relationships. And I also have had to learn the hard way. And it's like once you're in one narcissistic relationship and you really do the work, you're like, well, never doing that again. And it's so unfortunate 
that, you know, it's such a hard lesson in life to learn because I think a lot of people step into them and they're really unconscious at the time and the allure is there and it's very intoxicating. And then, you know, kind of learning that harder lesson later on. Um, And I think a lot of that has to do with the neurochemicals that are going off that have to do with actually what you didn't get as a baby and in your early developmental phases. Yeah, it's interesting. And I wonder also how other traumas might play in. So when I was 10, I was put into a back brace for six years that literally like kept me from like chin to like the inner thighs, like a just encased, like in a cage where you could literally not breathe. And our nervous system, right, needs Mm. to regulate and breath is the core of that. So the, the connection I made or sort of uncovered, I didn't go as far back as, you know, or like infancy or whatever. I, I come from a very loving family, but maybe there were some developmental needs that didn't get hit. But I was having fun before I fell on a bike and got stitches, which led to the appointment where when I was at the doctor's, my mom's like, can you look at her back? And then three months later, I was in a brace. So I somehow connected like me kind of being a little like rebel on my bike and falling, you know, in this way landed me in, uh, in a brace. I'm just sharing personally in case like people can start. I don't know. I think it yeah, helps yeah. to hear stories. So I think not having connection to my breath, being very sensitive as a child, very tuned into other people, and then like being constricted did, I think it shaped how I showed up wanting to be more people pleasing because I felt so unattractive in this horrible brace that made me look like a, it was like a robot, you know, with a metal bar down the, the front. And it was so so ugly and I, it was horrible. And so I think, yeah, maybe that was part of it or just having attention and like never dating in high school. I was in that brace, you know, and then going off to college and it's like, you know, you're sort of like back in your body and I don't know, it's just interesting. Yeah. And I mean, there could be a multitude of reasons. I mean, it's not always one or the other as to why that allure is so alluring, but the more you heal, and I know I've experienced it, the more that type of attention kind of you put you are like you have a different response to it you're like oh this isn't real this is the you know dopamine and fantasy and love bombing stuff that you know maybe the 20 year old version of you would be like oh he's really into me you know totally. um, so you kind you kind of learn you will learn the hard way and um hopefully don't lose you know resources and you know don't lose too much in the process because it can be pretty scary in, in some of those you know, codependent narcissistic dynamics. Totally. And some of the women listening may be parents, you know, if you, if it's okay, I would like to read just a little bit from your book about your experience that you share. You know, I think when it comes to our kids, it's like, we are all doing our best. Like, even when I read your book, I'm like, oh shoot, I hope I met that for my child. Or like, I hope, you know, those times, you know, you just look back at different phases and you hope that you did your best. But um, you wrote at 19, I had a boyfriend who was very wrapped up in work because he had his own company. After the first rush, when the beginning of the relationship became less exciting, he turned his attention back to work, which I now know is just what he needed to do. He was not a bad guy. He was just someone starting his own company and under a lot of stress. But his slow withdrawal touched a place of abandonment inside me, and I began to feel anxious. I lost weight, and life began to feel meaningless. It scared me, and over time, the turmoil inside of me built up to be so intense that I had to be hospitalized for severe anxiety. When the doctor asked me why I was there, I simply said, because my boyfriend doesn't love me. And this was because you wrote like your fear of being alone. Uh But this was a deeper wound that got majorly triggered. Can you help us understand this and take us into those, those early? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, when you're in the beginning of a relationship, there's emerging that goes along. It feels great. And then as you move through the relationship, you know, it goes through stages and you individuate. And as the as you both pull away and integrate back into your life, the pulling away for the someone who has abandonment wounds can awaken earlier um, neglect or earlier abandon. You're not conscious of it. So you, you keep trying to get the love from the person that you are um, trying to get the love from. And, and truly, it's a younger part of you that's recognizing, oh, this person's not coming back, you know, or the fear of the connection being lost, because, you know, connection is our biological imperative. And we'll do just about anything to stay in connection, because we literally need it. So if you have that anxious attachment, or that abandonment wound, you will turn yourself into a pretzel, 
you will feel a lot of someone pulling away. You will have a visceral response in your body when someone shuts down on you. All of that is memory around, is it safe? Am I safe? Is connection going to be consistent? Yeah. And the anxiety was that severe though. Uh, how did they help you? You know, if uh, what, I'm just curious, cause I think like parents do worry about their kids in that first relationship. And so obviously that hit something so deep. So does it go back to how deep that wound was or just our response to it from, you know, the wounding of children and not getting some developmental needs met, like you had talked about earlier? And they didn't really help me in the hospital, but I have to say that's when I read the book Facing Codependency by Pia Melody. And that it, that book literally helped me, which is part of the reason why I decided to write a book of my own, Interesting. because I wanted to write the codependency book that's really about attachment, because that's really what codependency is about. So, you know, I don't know how I got my hands on that book, but I was in the hospital and I read that book and I was like, oh my God, this is me. And it brought me so much relief. And I think it was the beginning of my healing journey, but uh, many, many years until I really held my abandonment wound. But at least I had started to become, I, I started to grab onto something that gave me an explanation that I wasn't crazy for feeling what I was feeling. And, you know, that was important to me, but, you know, and then I would, I saw, some, I saw a psychiatrist and a therapist as I left, but it was it was many, it was more years. It was later on that I did some deeper healing and, you know, similar relational patterns that kept showing up in my life as, as many listeners. I mean, I think it's not that we keep picking the same person is that the wound stays inside of us. And sometimes <laughs> it gets played out differently with different people. Yes. Um, and so really becoming aware of that. And I, I think in some and if you're listening and you're in a relationship or not in a relationship, the agency is you can always do the work wherever you're at. And that's one thing I learned is I did a lot of my work in an unhealthy relationship because it brought up all my work and I could make it not about him. I started connecting it to deeper roots. So there's a lot of agency in that. But yeah, I, I think that hospital trip, I mean, I was I was really young, but um, I was having separation anxiety and, you know, my parents didn't know what to do. They still don't know what to do. Um, with that kind of stuff, they're not like emotionally equipped, at least they weren't then. And I, I'm more emotionally aware now, but you know, the book helped me. And, and I think that's, that's what made me want to, I grabbed onto that book and that's what made me want to write the book, this book. Isn't that interesting? I think, you know, a lot of times some of the wounds that we have in fact, inform our path, right. And we end up teaching what we needed to heal within ourselves or having our, the direction of our life be impacted by that. So in my twenties, like there was like this whole awakening of like possibility and joy coming back in. And it was like a slow, steady thing. And I had all this personal success. I mean, pers professional success happening while I was also still coming out of a really hard time. And so I was, you know, explaining this to someone I love recently that you can sometimes be holding both things at the same Absolutely. time. Right. That, right. But I don't think that's how life is portrayed, whether through the movies like you talk about or in books, you know, it's like we think yeah. somebody's going to come rescue us and having any emotion uh, that's not happiness means you're you're not OK. Absolutely. I, I You said that very beautifully. I mean, any all emotions are OK. All of them make sense. You know, and I talk a lot about how to validate that internal experience. And, yeah, you can be happy and grieving at the same time, you know, that we have very, we have many multi, multi experiences throughout our day. And I think there's this snapshot of people online or, so, oh, they're happy. They're a happy couple. They're happy. And it's like, that's so not true. I go through so many emotions in one day. I cry in a day. I laugh in a day. I'm depressed in a day. I'm anxious. Like we're just constantly vacillating and we're not typically these static robots, although many people are disconnected and have to be, but Many of us are are grieving and happy and and going through a variety of of emotions throughout our day. Yeah, completely. Talk to us about our little me's. Who are our little yeah, me's? Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of listeners are probably have heard of inner child work. I would say that you know, little me is how I refer to the inner child. But I really, you know, if 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 you're having sensation in your body because between zero and four, but also later that is stored memory. And so a lot of the book, I'm trying to help you connect to the body and that little me is speaking through the body. And that's mm -hmm. where sensation lives. And sensation is a big 
um, indicator of what little me is thinking. So when your partner shuts down or doesn't show up and your body or gut is exploding or your heart hurts, it's like that is part of your, 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 I want to call it trauma, but I don't want to freak people out, but it's part of your little me saying, I'm scared. I'm worried. This feels familiar. Um, anything in terms of connection and change in connection with you. And we'll, we'll say your romantic partner for, cause we'll say, we're going to stay to that, um, can wake up little me's neuroception or little me's memory of what, what might feel threatening or what feels safe. Okay. And talk to us about our internal protectors and our nurturers. So when I did therapy back in my twenties, when I was sort of coming out of this and actually feeling like it was okay to do it. I mean, I'm, I, I'm older than you are. Like, I feel like in my twenties, you know, in the early nineties, I don't know. It was, I mean, people did go seek therapy, but there was still a part of me that was feeling some shame about needing to reach out and get help and not being able to figure it out on my own. Like we have all these internal messaging that we've like create barriers in our lives around. And um, she did internal family systems. So I was mm-hmm. sort of familiar with some of this and and I, and I it helped me realize like, oh, that's the firefighter. Or like, you know, we had, I, it might be different language, but I really resonated with what you were talking about in the book. And I think my audience would love learning more about this because they're going to see it not just in themselves, but like I said, for those who have kids or teens, not just teens, but kids, they're seeing more of these parts playing out. Sure, yeah, we have different parts. Um, Really, as a baby, we internalize our primary caregivers. We're internalizing the essence of a lot of people throughout our lives. And we're also internalizing parts that protect us. And so I talk about protectors and protectors are the part of us that's like, you got to look a certain way in order to be happy, or you have to do this in order to be, you know, or they can be parts of our parents that are shaming or critical, but they serve a purpose. They protect us from failing or they protect us from being fat, you know, our biggest fears. They think they serve a purpose. So essentially our protectors are always just trying to protect us. Okay. And from what, you know, usually our core wound being rejected, failure, whatever. Usually they end up creating, recreating the, the problem, but yes, really they can um, be mean. I don't mean to interrupt you, but they can be really mean, right? Those voices they, yeah, can be really they can cruel, be mean, but they're yeah. there for good reason. They're literally trying to protect you from some other deep seated feeling or mm. wound. Like if I can be really hard on you and get you to work out a lot and restrict your eating, you'll be beautiful. So you'll never have to feel ugly because Mm -hmm. I never want you to feel ugly. So they're really protecting you from something. And so it's about being with the part of you that's scared of being ugly or being with the part of you that um, has felt that way before, you know, has felt rejected before and when and going back to that root. Um, And then the other side are inner nurturers. So, you know, we can internalize really positive people and really warm, receptive, caring people into our world. And we can use those as resources as well. So, you know, my grandmother was one for me. So imagining her in the room, what does it feel like to have her next to me? Not just what she's going to say, but what does it feel like? And as you're healing and you're developing healthy relationships with others, other people who are nurturing and kind and supportive you actually can internalize their essence. You know, I've had many clients say, oh, what would Jessica say here? Or I just imagined you there. And that's how you know they're taking in your essence. And that's not woo-woo. That's actually neuroscience. We take in the essence of other and it becomes part of us. So it's pretty cool when you think of how interconnected we are. Yeah. And you give exercises about how to access both understand the protectors, give it voice so they can soften and then make room for the nurturers. You mentioned a term a couple of times now earlier, uh, love bombing. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us what that is. Cause you know, I think it's some terms like gaslighting at some point got like sort of popular. And I mean, I think that's how I actually learned what it was and realized that's what had happened to me, but what's mm-hmm. love bombing? Love bombing is just when you meet someone and they tell you how much they love you in the beginning of the relationship. And they tell you about the future they want to spend with you. And it all happens way too fast. And there's a fantasy built around, you know, this type of intoxicating bond and um, narcissists do it. And and I have to say, sometimes narcissists is an early wound. So maybe some narcissists understand that they're doing it and some manipulation tactic, but I actually know a lot of narcissists that do it that actually believe the love bombing. 
So they believe they met the one and they, they, they believe they buy into the story too. Wow. And I'm not, I'm not saying that they're completely innocent, but in some ways they are a product of really early wounding. And so they want to make a fantasy and they want it to escape pain, you know? So all of those rescue fantasies and love bombing, all of those are protecting us from the pain of reality or the pain of not being in our feelings. So the they'll, they'll, narcissist, narcissistic wound will typically jump from one relationship to the next to escape the pain and stay in the dopamine high mm. of the earliest relationship. And then a woman or a man who struggles with abandonment will feel rescued in those relationships until that person kind of jumps to the next and gets bored with the other later stages of a relationship. It's so fascinating. And I think we can all like either from own personal experience or watching a friend go through it, like we see these dynamics play out. Um, I'd be curious, you know, I have women in my audience who are listening who who are dating in midlife. So they may have lost a spouse or divorced, you know, suddenly divorced and not expecting it or never got married. Um, what advice can you give as a couples therapist, you know, about how to approach dating midlife, you know, and I think in hopefully I, I found for myself that many of us, you know, have a better sense of self, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're still going to make the best decisions going into a relationship, especially if we're feeling vulnerable based on however, maybe let's say a relationship fell apart through something unexpected, like, you know, infidelity or something that maybe created a wound, a new wound. Yeah, I mean, making sure that you've processed the lessons and integrated, hopefully, the grief from whatever happened prior. Um, you know, looking for some red flags, trying not to buy into the fantasy, going slow. You know, the earlier the wound, the higher the need to merge. Mm. And that becomes like, that's a developmental thing, baby and mother wanting to merge one energetic unit. So the slower you can go, the less merging you can do in the beginning, which can be very hard if you have an early wound, the safer it is and the more in reality you can be. Um, and if you start to idealize or fantasize about the person and you make them perfect, uh, just remember every relationship is here to bring up your wounds. They will go through many phases. It's rupture and repair. You want to look logically, does this person is there, is they, are they in alignment with me? Do, are their values the same as mine? Like, and just go slow. I mean, going slow, which is not easy to do. I get it. What does it mean to become self-full? So you don't actually become self-full, but it's a state that you access a little bit more. So people more anxious become selfless a lot in order to stay in connection. They self-abandon. And you can say that the other end of the spectrum is selfish. They become more isolated. Both those states, selfless, self-abandoning, and selfish are born of sympathetic activation and of fear, right? Mm -hmm. And so being self-full is being in the middle of learning how to give and receive um, in a place that feels safe. So like kind of what I do with a lot of clients is notice where they are throughout the day because we can yep. shift even within a day. Um, so that's really also a ventral state. So I'm looking at sympathetic states versus ventral states where we feel safe in connection and starting to understand when am I in a safe connection? Like right now, you and I are pretty safe. We're having this conversation. Our eyes are meeting. We're having nice open dialogue. At any moment, something can cue me and mm -hmm. shift me out of safety into like, oh, well, what if she doesn't like me? And I start people pleasing or so overcompensating. And then all of a sudden I'm in the self list state, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, so noticing when we shift throughout the days into different states. Okay. That's so good. So I'm just curious, just as it comes to depression, how do you define what depression is and how do you think, you know, society needs to be embracing or looking at how we navigate being sad or deeply sad? Mm. Yeah. I mean, so depression is a protector. Ah. Uh, yeah. And so is anxiety. Um, it's the way we're coping with life and, and unable to process our emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of society is very left shifted. And so um, being with in the presence of people who can be with really be with the sadness or allow the sadness to come up and allow those emotional experiences to be felt, then the, the suppressed stuff usually does come up. But there's not that many available people who can hold spaces for people who struggle with chronic depression. So it takes time. Um, you know, I think 
we have a really big problem in our culture around um, where we're headed and, and we're very left shifted and in survival mode and competitive and, you know, self-reliance and independence are so glorified yes. when really, you know, interdependence and community and support and vulnerability are actually provenly, scientifically proven to help us live lives that are thriving and full of more joy and meaning and all of that. So, you know, it's a complicated issue because of how our culture positions us to believe, to attain what might make us feel happy. And so we lose or we disconnect from our core self in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And we're fed a lot of these messages that aren't actually what makes us feel whole. And so it's, it's connection. It's human connection that makes us feel connected and whole and gives mm. us deeper meaning. And again, that's our biological imperative. Stephen, Stephen Porges has done a lot of work on it. And, and really, it's our it's our quality of our relationships that really determine the quality of our life. Mm. And so it's so important to remember that, you know, um, and if you know someone who's suffering with depression, that's a, a way that their body is trying to keep them safe from the pain because I don't have a safe enough place or um, safe enough people to really start to deal with the underlying pain that they're suppressing. That's so fascinating. Don't we, do we not all experience depression then? Is it not just a part of life at some point? Like I think of like, if you lose someone you love or even a pet or. Absolutely. I'm talking about like clinical depression. Got it. Um, where you're not think, functioning. Okay. Yeah, right, no, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think they're, there are seasons and there are moments when I'm down or anyone's down and you have a couple of days and it's, there's nothing wrong with you, you know, and, and that's fine. And knowing that, okay, I'm just sad today or understanding maybe there is a cause of the sadness or, you know, maybe you're sad because you watched the news and something deeply touched you on the news. Like all of that makes sense. We don't live in a, a blissful world. We live in a world full of joy, but we also live in a world full of a lot of realities that are really hard. Yes. Um, you know, so we can't just bury our head in the sand as well. And and those realities, wars, things are going on, they're gonna impact us if we're a sensitive soul. Yeah, no, if totally. We're in touch. And thanks for making the distinction and also to help us understand that that kind of level of depression is in fact a protector. I you wrote about it in the book. I'm remembering that now that I read that, but I don't think it just hit until you said it out loud. Um, are you You've got your meditations and, you know, stuff with the book, which are so beautiful, um, the heart centered work and the heart, what do you call it? The heart, the brain heart connection. Mm -hmm. yeah, Can you explain what that's about? Yeah. I mean, so heart math Institute does a lot of research around cohesion and your heart and your gut and your brain are what we call in neuroscience, your embodied brain. And there's a highway of information that actually shoots 80% up from your body to your brain. Your body is sending so much more information to your brain every day than your brain is actually sending. And so um, part of the work in the book is getting in touch with the sensational experience in your body and, you know, the embodied experience of your childhood and the embodied experience and, and getting you in touch with these experiences so that you can awaken to more of what's going on in your life and that you can use your current relationships as a portal in to some of your deeper work. So the vagus nerve is this, this nerve that connects everything. And, you know, we have our social engagement system, which is up here and it's our highest evolution. And then we drop down into our heart space and there's sympathetic activation. And then there's a dorsal, you know, so there's this whole bit of information and it's all connected. Like our brain is not like the separate thing. It's all connected and we call it the embodied brain and the embodied brain is, you know, really this idea of really looking at the holistic part of our nervous system and how all these parts are interconnected and really communicating with each other all day long. Wow. It's so fascinating. And I think the meditations are beautiful. So what's so, I always like things that are hopeful and he, you know, it's just like knowing that there is healing possible, there's help po available, like you're not alone, we're all in this together, it's part of the human experience, there's resources, you found that book when you were in a dark place, I found a book that was in, in a dark place, it, it impacted our spiritual growth, as well as our growth as humans, and as, you know, um, our ability to be out in the world. Um, we covered a lot today, but before we wrap up, is there anything that you want 
my listeners to take away from the conversation about the work you're doing or um, our understanding of the work that you do in the world? Yeah, I mean, if you're listening and some of this resonated with you, you're so not alone. And I'm so glad that I got to share this with you. And and like you said, like we have an inherent wisdom within our body to seek out healing and healing relationships and to kind of be called to what we need to do. So if you're listening and, and healing or something really resonated with you, like your body has a wisdom and start listening to that wisdom. And you might start get called to certain people or certain books or certain places and start to listen to that because that is your body's wisdom of saying, I'm, I'm feeling like I need to go in this direction. And the inherent wisdom of source, uh, warm, safe, non-judgmental relationships, the more you your body experiences them, the more the wisdom of your body will seek them. And, and so that's how you heal your nervous system. So we are equipped with so much inherent wisdom, every single one of us. And even though I'm an expert, you listening, you're the expert in your body and your body has a unique like wisdom of its own. So just really listen to it and seek out warm, safe relationships and keep being curious. And yeah, that's all I really have to say. Thank you for having me. It's so beautiful. I love what you just said. It's so beautiful. Now everyone should pick up a copy of your book. It's speaking of beautiful. It's so beautiful. You're going to see parts of yourself, your family members, people you dated. I mean, it's all there. And then also it just has so many exercises and ways to just get grounded back into your body and to be back on that path of loving yourself. Where can people get connected with you? Where can they follow you or pick up the book? Where do you like me to direct them? Yeah, I mean, it's on Amazon. If you put anxiously attached in, you know, it's it's everywhere. It's in, I think, 11 countries. And, um, you know, so you can get it anywhere. I have an Instagram, Jessica Baum, LMHC. Uh, I have a company down here in Florida called the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach, where I have a group practice. And then I have a coaching company called BeSelfFull.com. That's B-E-S-E-L-F-F-U-L-L. Um, and so I have a team of people that are trained in attachment theory and this kind of stuff. So we can coach people who might want to go through some of this type of work. So yeah, I'm all over the place. You know, Jessica Baum, luckily you put me in and a lot of a lot of the right um, things come up on on a Google search. Yeah, you're doing beautiful work in the world, and I'm so grateful for you. And all of the show notes will be over at thegoodlifecoach.com with all of Jessica's links to make it super easy. And one thing that I'm mentioning now, because I'm realizing it's literally right on your phone. So as you're listening, listening from your favorite podcast player, all those links will be available right there including a link to Jessica's book. So thanks so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned so much, both from your book and just sitting with you today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gained some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now. This podcast is presented for entertainment and educational purposes only. Any information provided is not intended to be a substitute for medical, mental health, or other professional advice. Seek out your trusted healthcare provider or other qualified professional for all matters dealing with your health and well-being. Any opinions or information provided by a guest are their own and not those of Michelle Lamoureux or the company.